why don't we get started? It's around seven o'clock. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming. We, this, we hold a town hall ward meeting in every ward every year, and this is our ninth because we've done the other eight wards, and we're here at uh, Maine Dunstable School just after school's out, so it's a very warm night, and I want to thank you all for coming. And I'm going to introduce you to some of the public officials that are here, but we all really appreciate your input. Everybody learns from each meeting we hold because you often have thoughts that we haven't thought about or you come up with issues that need to be dealt with. So we really, really appreciate uh, your coming out tonight. We have Ernie Jetty from Ward 5, the Ward 5 Alderman. Thank you, Ernie. Uh, we have Joel Ackerman on the Board of Public Works. Thank you, Joel. And from the state legislature, we have Allison Nutting Wong over here, Allison. And Mike Peterson. Thank you, Mike. Now, I think I saw Gloria McCarthy. Where is Gloria here somewhere? Oh, right. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Gloria. Um, Former Chief Gallopo, Steve Gallopo, a Ward 5 resident, right over here. Raise your hand. He helped us with the Safe Stations program. I'll always appreciate that very much. Well, there's a lot going on with the city. And what I usually do here is I talk through a few of the things that are going on and that we're trying to accomplish. And then uh, you're going to hear some presentations, one from Lauren Byers. Uh, who is over somewhere around here. Lauren is over here about the paving program. We have Lisa Photo, who's the Director of Public Works, Lauren's boss. She's here and is here to address any issues that we have with Public Works. And, excuse me, we have Deb, who's here, for, Deb Chisholm is here from the Planning Department, and she's going to tell you a little bit about what we want to do and which we're beginning to accomplish along the Nashua River, just to give you um, a few other perspectives as to some of the things that are happening in Nashua. Now we, as mayor, I've been in office three, three plus years right now, and a primary focus for city government is, of course, the economic climate. Trying to do everything we can to promote economic growth, the creation of jobs, uh, an economic opportunity for everyone in the city, as well as a growing tax base. And on that front, things are going well. There are a number of jobs, many jobs have been added in Nashua in the last few years. Down in the south end at Gateway Hills, it's gone from almost no one working in the former deck facility to 3,000 people working in that facility and some of the buildings around it. Uh, we have, uh, Amazon has come to Nashua with 70 or 80 jobs. Uh, there's something called Prudential Supply, a very high-tech linen firm, uh, uniform firm, has come to Nashua, built a facility, and brought 150 or so jobs. Boston Billiards has added over 100 jobs. Now, Boston Billiards is a charitable gaming site. And before, th up to about three years ago, Nashua was saying we wouldn't allow those. Uh, I, I said, well, it can help our are nonprofits because 35% of the gross proceeds from any charitable gaming site is given to nonprofits. So we, in the last uh, two and a half years, about around between almost five million dollars. It was 4.6 million dollars had been distributed to local local charities and nonprofits out of Boston Billiards alone. Uh, up to a month or two ago, and then they're doing $50,000 a week to various charities. So uh, each charity gets one week, and typically right now, a nonprofit is getting a $50,000 plus check, which is a huge boost for 50 nonprofits a year. So that has, and that has added 100 jobs. Uh, we're also looking to try to create housing in the city, especially downtown, because downtown is definitely an economic development opportunity. There's been a lot of disinvestment in downtown for many years, uh, especially the neighborhoods right around Main Street. So I suggest, I, I proposed that when I, when I ran a few years ago that we would 
add 500 units of downtown housing in four years. And we have reached that and, re and are exceeding it now with the mill to housing conversion on Franklin Street, which is called Lofts 34, the former National Corp facility. The uh, riverfront landing uh, over by Hudson with the Marshall Street apartments on Marshall and East Hollis Street, which is a workforce housing project, meaning uh, for people who make what they say 80% of AMI or area median income. That really means families making fifty to $60,000. Uh, th those plus smaller uh, improvements around uh, in various places, and that has been a big, a big boost because it adds to the tax base and adds customers to patronize the downtown businesses, and in the end helps raise the property taxes uh, downtown. The downtown business district, which is about a quarter of a mile, square mile, generates about six million dollars in property taxes every year. Now, Nashua has 30 some, 31 square miles, so this is a tiny part of Nashua, and yet they generate six million dollars and require very few services. Not many school kids in the central business district, plus uh, very few, we don't even, we don't do garbage, as an example, we don't do garbage pickup down there because it's all commercial, paid for by the businesses. So if we can expand the downtown tax base by adding customers and business and housing downtown, we might be able to expand that $6 million to nine or to $12 million, uh, helping to subsidize services throughout the city in every neighborhood, like here at Maine Dunstable School. And I now see Tracy Pappas from the Board of Public Works is here. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you for coming. Um, on another front, uh, in education, we know that schools are a vital part of any community and that if we want a strong community, we need strong schools. Here at Maine Dunstable School, we offer excellent education for every, child, every child every day, and we want to make sure we do that at every school across the district. Now, one big school project that is coming up is the potential of either renovating the Elm Street Middle School or replacing it with a new middle school down in the, near here in the southwest part of the city, off Buckmeadow Road, land that the city, uh, land that the city already owns and which was reserved for school purposes. The, the Elm Street Middle School is, has structural problems and other problems. It doesn't really conform with uh, current state standards and even a renovation would not make it conform. Uh, but the Joint Special School Building Committee is going through a careful analysis to see what are the relative costs of uh, renovating the Elm Street Middle School or, or replacing it with a new school. And that should be done this fall and based upon that analysis uh, the city will move forward to uh, improve not only Elm Street but or replace it but also improve the other middle schools. Those are of course Fairgrounds and Penichuk. And we would like to even out the population between the three schools. Right now Elm Street has 1,200 students and the others much smaller numbers. So we'd like to even that out at 800 per, per, per student or per school and that will take replacing some uh, adding some classrooms at Penichuk, replacing some portables. And we think that by doing this and by getting an upgrade in the curriculum of middle schools at the same time that we can really uh, greatly improve the middle school education that we offer for all of our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. Um, we are, you're gonna hear we're doing a lot of work on the riverfront and we're gonna hear about that from, from Deb. We're doing a lot of paving because the infrastructure in the city has been neglected over the years, especially the paving, which uh, we, which for decades was, uh, we, we underinvested in the paving because, and in that portion of the in infrastructure. City has about 306 miles of streets and for quite a while we were doing five, six, seven miles of paving every year. 
But I, along with the Board of Aldermen, when, uh, when Brian was president, embarked on a paving plan of action to um, upgrade and, and greatly expand the, the number of streets we're paving. In 2017, we did 17 miles. 2018, we did 25. And this year, in 2019, we will be doing uh, 31 miles of streets. And in addition, 30 miles of so-called crack sealing, which helps to preserve streets at a very nominal cost. The Board of Public Works uh, has been totally on board with all of this and has supported this all the way along, in addition to the Board of Aldermen. Uh, those are some of the things that are going on. Uh, we wanted to, because some of you live in close proximity or in the neighborhood of the landfill, we wanted to mention that uh, there are some potential changes going on and I think uh, we can answer any questions that you have about that. We don't, we don't know for sure what's going to happen because we're, not, we're still in a kind of an examination phase. But we know that the public works facilities are in very poor stage of repair. We have Mine Falls Park, which is, excuse me, we have Greeley Park, which is really in bad shape, the building's there. We have a building on Riverside, which, you know, needs some help. And we have, of course, the street department, which is near uh, Stelos, off West Hollis Street. Now, the problem at the street department uh, is that the entire area there was originally desi designed or thought to be a public works area. So this was, the public works garage went in in the late 70s, uh, before Stelos, before the Y, before Conway, that whole area was sort of reserved for public works and expansions that are necessary. But over the years, of course, we saw, and these are great additions, uh, you know, to the, to the, to the city and our uh, and the activities that are available to our residents. But the Stelos went in, the Y, then Conway, and then the skateboard park more recently, leaving only about six or seven acres for public works. They really need 20 acres. And the equipment, there's an, also the building was built in the 70s with a, with a federal grant, very cheap construction, so there's a lot of work that's required there. But even if it were done there, uh, the, uh, the, the, the trucks can't be stored inside. We've got trucks in the Y parking lot. Uh, we've got trucks actually being stored at the landfill at times over at Burke Street. So there really isn't enough room to store the equipment. And of course, the equipment, most of it being outside, especially during the winter, uh, it deteriorates more rapidly than it would if we could store it inside, as many public works uh, departments do in other, other communities. So we are looking at, uh, at, at alternatives. And we are going to engage a construction manager to advise us as to whether it makes more sense to try to expand or improve place, you know, uh, facilities in place or potentially to add inside the landfill perimeter, this would not be outside the current fence, but inside the landfill perimeter, a first an office building to consolidate the office functions and potentially later on a, a garage that would house the equipment. Uh, those are alternatives that we're thinking about. I know people here, of course, live either cl closer or a little further away, but in this, this area of the city. And uh, you may have thoughts about the landfill uh, in general or about those particular uh, possibilities. So um, now, I, th I thought before I conclude, now Nashville, of course, we, we, we have many, many people working very hard uh, in many areas in the city, our nonprofits, uh, Great American Downtown, the city employees, uh, and uh, thank you to uh, the city employees who are here. Uh, they, we, they work hard every day, uh, very hard on behalf of the city. We have a very engaged group of residents, and so the city is making progress as a result of the as I said, the efforts of many, many people, our state delegation, we can get into some of the things that are happening there. 
but recently we have gotten some accolades in the last couple of years. Uh, in 2018, Nashua was named one of the safest places to retire in the country. In 2018, Nashua was named one of the best run, it was the ninth best run city in the United States according to this survey. Uh, thank you. Well, it's not, I play a small part. There are many career people who work for the city who've been at it for much longer than I have. So, um, in 2018, uh, Nashua was named the best place for millennials in Hillsborough County. We do want to make this a place where young people want to live so that we can retain our young people and hopefully attract others. Without a younger generation, any community is in bad shape. So that's why we're working on many of these downtown initiatives, the river, the housing, uh, rail service, Dan's here, uh, he's a big rail advocate, we're trying to get that. Uh, many of the things that make the, would make Nashua a better place to live for us, but also for younger residents, younger uh, generation who we hope will want to locate here. In 2018, Nashua was named uh, the, Nashua was, it was said that Nashua had some of the least amount of crime in a mid-sized city. In 2017, the Nan Nashua Manchester area was named one of the happiest places in the country. So I think we all share that. In 2017, Nashua was named the safest city in the country, and in 2017, Nashua was named one of the best cities to live in America. So we're very proud of these accolades because it takes a group effort to make, it all po make them possible. So I want to thank everyone here and everywhere else who's been very involved in this. Now, I thought we'd take a couple of minutes uh, first to hear from Lauren uh, about the paving. Uh, then we'll hear from uh, Deb about what's going on with the riverfront. Don't be shy. Come on up here. You'll see Lauren's not shy at all. I don't know what she's doing with it. Uh, so this is Lauren Byers from the Department of Public Works. Hello, everybody. I have to talk into this. Um, if you know me and a lot of you do from the school, I can talk to 2,000 teenagers without a microphone. But we are on TV. Well, we will be, so they want us to use a microphone. OK. So I'm here to talk about paving, and I hate following the mayor. First of all, he knows as much about paving as I do. And he does this accolade thing, and then he throws paving out there. So how am I going to look after that kind of entrance? But OK. Oh, wait, I left off Beth's paved streets in the United States. <laughs> all right. That's a, I don't think that exists. Not but really. That was a joke. <laughs> all right. So you might have noticed, Maine Dunstable, that we have been paving. And it's not always a very pretty process, as you've seen. Uh, it's dirty. There are dips. There are things in the road that you didn't know were there before. Maybe just a passing glance as you went by at 50 miles an hour. And now you're like, wow, look at that. So we apologize for all the inconvenience you felt. Uh, we are also on some of the side streets in this area. And you will experience that as well on your side streets. Uh, it's important to know, though, um, that this is so critical to the city. We should have been doing this for a very long time. We finally got the funding to take care of these streets. And if we do it right, and we keep plugging along on our 10-year plan, all the city streets that need to see paving will see it. And people will actually want to drive in Nashua. And you could take your little convertible out, and go for rides, and you're not going to pop all your tires. So we're looking, and we won't have to patch them, all those potholes all winter long. All right, so there's two kinds of paving. And some of you, we get a lot of phone calls about why is my street open for six weeks, for eight weeks? It's a good question. So we, we haven't seen a project of this size in this city before. I don't think ever, ever. So it's confusing as to why. In the past, we've done a couple of miles. And so we open the street, and we're only on two or three streets a year, right? So it's, it's not a long process on two or three streets. We're doing 40 streets or 31 streets or whatever we're doing. I guess some carryover from last year, so we're a little higher than that. Um, and that's a big process. So what happens is a contractor gets the contract, let's say, to do 15 streets in a phase. Well, he's going to go through with his milling machine and mill all 15 streets at the same time. So that could take a couple weeks. Then his milling machine takes off for, let's say, Portsmouth, because that's where his next job is. Then his crew comes through. A crew comes through and adjusts the structures. Then they go to another 
city somewhere in the state. Then they come through and they put the binder down, which is that first layer that you thought was the actual pavement, and you were wrong, and they came back again, didn't they? And so they come and put that binder down, and then those machines take off for another city. And then finally, they come with the final paving machines, and they finish. So depending on the number of streets in a phase and the serious condition of those streets, it could take anywhere from four to eight weeks or longer. Um, most of them are in the four-week range, especially the side streets. Now, um, there's two types of paving. There's resurfacing and reclamation. So everybody, we want to do resurfacing. It's cheaper. It's faster. It's just digging down a few inches, and you still got a beautiful base, and you put some new asphalt down, and you take off. Re reclamation is a huge process. It's extremely expensive, and it takes a lot of time, and that's where you see these, you know, we're down into the gravel and the dirt. It takes us forever to get out of there. So you may say, well, my street is in far worse shape than the street four blocks over. Why are you doing their street and you're not doing my street? Also a very good question. So the reason is we want to hit the resurfacing streets while there's still resurfacing streets. If we do all of the reclamations first, by the time we get to the resurfacing streets, they're going to be reclamation streets. And it's going to cost the city a fortune. And it's going to take a lot more time. And it's going to be a lot uglier for a lot longer. And it's not a really good um, value for your money as taxpayers. So that's why we do it that way. Now, there are some streets that are reclamations that we, they're arterial streets. They're big. And we need to get those done. Anybody travel on Kinsley Street lately? <laughs> right. So you know what I'm talking about. That's a good example of a reclamation street. So Kinsley Street, we started today. Yes, structures. So avoid it. If you have to go downtown, go over the bridge to Hudson and come back. <laughs> no, I'm just, Broad Street's almost done. So Broad Street should be done soon. All of the big streets, Amherst Street, anybody? Anybody been up there lately? Yeah, it's not good. I go up there every day, so it, it's, not, it's not great. My doggy daycare is up there. Um, but those streets will all be done by the end of July. So you will have half a summer to enjoy yourself in the city. Um, what else do we want to talk about? I think that was pretty much every, anything. Does anybody have any questions for paving? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I've, I think I've called you about this. Um, I'll say the word water. Does that sound like me? <laughs> uh, Whitford Road. Yes. Is that going to be done this year? It is on the paving. I believe it's on the paving list. Okay, is it? it is. There's huge pa I passed holes. one. I'm going to call that in tomorrow, by the way. Between yeah. the school and uh, Main Dunstable, there was a right. huge one on the right-hand side and going there's, out here. There's more than more. that. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my concern is because it's so traveled because of yep. the school. Right. That something really needs to be it is done. On, it is on the list. Um, I'll get them out here at least in the interim, to fill those giant potholes. So I'll go talk to them tomorrow. For the reclamation, <clears throat> would that be on the reclamation list? I don't know. It doesn't look like a reclamation. Just because it has potholes, it doesn't mean it's a reclamation. But they're really... Yeah, <laughs> we have a lot of those. I mean, I could walk through it and not go all the way down, so it's not that bad yet. But I don't think it's a reclamation. I'll have to check on that. I think that's a resurfacing street. Yes? How are we doing on sewer separation? I haven't heard an update on that in years. So this is a very interesting question. We're not doing great. Um, the money, <laughs> uh, we, I actually had a question about that today online on an email. Um, so the paving contract is strictly to pave our streets. So um, the question was some of the streets that are being paved where they had hoped to have sewer separation, especially in the downtown area. We don't have the money for that. That's, the paving is very strict. What we can do, the parameters on those streets of what we're paving, very, very strict. So unfortunately, that doesn't cover water issues or sewer separations. So right now, that's well, a huge let me Let me supplement that. So yeah, just so people know, um, in the inner part of the city, as in many older cities in the east, there is a combined storm and sanitary sewer system. There's one pipe that handles the sewage coming from homes and businesses as well as stormwater that enters the system through catch basins and the like. Bill could probably explain all this uh, even. You no, know, they started that many years ago and then they came up with some kind of a different program. So the Lock Street area and the uh, French Hill area. The problem with the combined sewer system is that when there's a storm, the, sewer, the system is not big enough to really handle all of the water. And it ends up pushing water out uh, into the river. Called, this is called a combined sewer overflow. 
So some years ago, the EPA began to pressure, ask, insist that communities prevent the combined sewer overflow. So Nashua adopted, I would say, a hybrid approach to, this is, goes back some years. Some sewers were separated, and what that means is you build a, you go into the street and you build an entirely <coughs> different system for the stormwater. You leave the sewer, but then you build a parallel system for the stormwater. Now that's what exists in our more, our newer neighborhoods. Because when the developers came in in the 80s or the 90s, probably in the 70s, the, uh, the developer is, is required to build two systems, the sewer system and the storm system. But again, in these older neighborhoods, that didn't exist. So uh, when sewer is separated, you go into a street, you dig it up, and you build a storm system parallel to the sewer system. And that is extremely expensive. So the decision was made to do some of those, but also there, is, there was the decision to try to build a so-called wet weather facility which would hold all of this, you know, tens of millions of gallons, and it would hold this, the, the effluent, the combined flow, uh, in, the t in this huge containment wet weather facility, and then would gradually run it through the sewage treatment plant. So after the storm is over, the combined flow is run through the sewage treatment plant, thereby the water is treated and most, in, almost, it, usually there's a, 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 an avoidance of the, um, of the uh, combined sewer overflow, CSO. Uh, so we have kind of both systems at work. Now, it's kind of a, it's not a clear choice as to what, which is better. I mean, uh, for a while it seemed like the separation would have been better because even with the wet weather facility, occasionally there is still an overflow. On the other hand, uh, the EPA is beginning to get after even the storm systems because there's salt and other things in the storm systems. So there might have to be additional work on the storm system. And with the, with the, uh, the uh, wet weather facility that runs everything through the treatment plant, things like salt and road oil and stuff like that, that gets caught in, this, in the storm system actually gets cleaned by running it through the treatment plant. So Lisa is, can probably elaborate on all this, but uh, that's kind of what we have. You, you did a good job. I was, I was here to try to help you, but you did a good job. Yeah, there, there's really two methods by which you can um, address this, and that is by separating. The city of Manchester has decided to separate um, all of their sewers. Um, or we can go, you can go the route that we went, which was the wet weather facility, as the mayor mentioned, and also um, our CSOs, which we have strategically placed um, around the city. Um, that has worked pretty well. Um, I think in some ways the decision was made long before I was director, but I think it was probably a good decision because as the mayor alluded to, when you separate everything, you haven't really solved the problem. You still have stormwater now that needs to be treated. And, and I think that's going to be a real challenge for communities coming down uh, the line. So at least all of our, or most of our water is going through the treatment plant and being treated, certainly through the wet weather facility. But, so that's, mm -hmm. that's really all I have to I had a question for the little lady. Yeah, yeah. Before. She'll come back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> ding, ding, off the hook. <laughs> no, you're talking about the fact is, is that you've been doing crack sealing. Yes. Is this something you're looking to do on a consistent basis? Yes. yes. Okay, then I worked for the, the street department. I retired from there. And a few years ago, well, this is before your time there, we had uh, purchased a crack sealing machine, or a small version because it was more of an experiment. And, and going through that process, we turned out it wasn't really, uh, didn't make much sense pretty much. But now that you're going in such a great detail, didn't you say it's 187,000 to do 30 miles? I think 187, I think it was? For the crack ceiling, I think that's yeah. 143,000 okay. for 30 miles. Now, is that 30 miles of road or is that 30 miles of cracks? 
30 miles of road. Okay. Well, the thing is, is, is that at that kind of money, why can't you just purchase your own craft ceiling machine? Then you can do it on a consistent basis all you want instead of looking for additional money. Because I know the unit itself is a, more like a glorified hot box. I mean, you guys understand what that is. It's just a little uh, adjustments to it. But to me, that would be so much cheaper us doing it that way and then spending, because what is it going to be next year? If it's 140, would it go 160 right. more? Right. So I'm kind of thinking that maybe some of these things, the street department ought to take on to themselves to save some money. But I'm going to ask Lisa to answer that. But of course, for $140,000 for 30 miles, it costs $11 million to do 30 miles of paving. So it is a very minor expense compared to paving. Well, I understand that part, but the part I'm saying is to save money, why not have the yeah. street department do it? So, Phil, you want to come up here for a second? I, I'm going to put him on the spot here. Uh, Phil Thibodeau is a, a foreman in the street department, and he is our um, actually paving expert in the city. So um, he could probably answer that. But the, to answer your question, I think and, and you know, I'm going to let you chime in, uh, Phil, if you want to. Um, but uh, if, you, if, you, if you see paving going on in the city by the street department, chances are this is the guy that's, that's behind it. But um, $140,000 really is not a lot of money for that amount of crack ceiling. It's, a, it's, it's actually, that's a pretty good price. Um, if we were to buy our own equipment, it's very, very expensive equipment. Um, yeah, really. and, and it's, it, it is pretty expensive to do, to do the kind of crack ceiling where, when I think back then, and again, it was before my time, right? Yeah, but it'd be so, the hot but we had a, we had a fairly small, yeah, we had a small, that, a small machine. All the extra work that you can do without having now to keep purchasing these individuals that come in, contracting yeah. it out. And the street, the people are very uh, experienced that so they can, they probably can do more than what the, the uh, company. So when I'm looking at the overall picture here, you're talking about, well, let's get the most of our dollar. Yep. Well, to me, that'd be the best way by moving it within the street department, because then you buy the unit, you own it. Yeah. So we you're not contracting money out to somebody else to do it, and you have the personnel that can do it, and you can do as much as you want. So so we, we don't have the personnel to do it. That's, all, that's the other piece of it. So not only is it ex expensive equipment, but we don't have the personnel. We can't keep up with what we need to do. Um, you know, Phil would tell you that we're trying to embark on our sidewalk program, haven't been able to do that yet just because we're so busy trying to do all the other things that we need to do between sink holes and, and uh, everything else. So, and, and, the pa and the paving that we have to do in the city, we're just, we, we don't have the manpower to be able to really do it effectively. I don't know if you, do you well, want to add anything? To agree with I that mean, we have done, we have I done an analysis. I've been 26 years, and I, I, uh, I'm pretty well experienced with how it works, all right? And I think you could get the manpower with the existing people that you have because it'd be important to crack ceiling because of the fact that it gives longer life to the street in the long run, you're saving more money by doing that. So you need to look over the overall picture of the expenses you're looking at. How can you save? By making some adjustments, you can save a lot of money by doing that. And honestly, like I said, uh, you do have the people there. You can do it. It only takes two people to do it, or three, if you want to use it, uh, and not use the driver. As, uh, but you can still do it. We've done yeah. a lot of stuff like that with, with a minimal amount of help, okay? I did with five people, 2,000 feet of sidewalk on Arlington Street. And we mm -hmm. did it with five people in one truck. Yep. Right? Why? Because the other people needed to be around. But we got the work done. And that's the thing I'm trying to say. Maybe it's a better distribution of your people as well. well and, and, I, and I appreciate your opinion. I do. Um, but um, I think that Phil would beg to differ with you, and, and so is with our, with our uh, management at the street department. So. John Ibarra is not here right now, but I don't know if you want to add anything. We are very short-staffed. Yeah. Uh, we're working with four-man oh. crews right now. And yeah. Could speak up a little, little louder. Oh, okay. Put him on the spot. I'm sorry. Back to the room. <laughs> <laughs> we are very short-staffed right now. We're dealing with four-man crews, and there's four crews out there. Between vacations and vacancies right now, we are really short-staffed, and we're having a hard time completing the tasks that we need to do. So. I, I hear you say that, but I, rem I remember that we dealt with vacations and everything. The biggest problem we had is the landfill needed personnel. We had to lose our personnel. That was the biggest yeah, problem. Well, and we're still dealing with that, the, too. The street personnel alone, you'd have more. All right? I'm sorry, but do the guys who collect trash have to go home at 1 o'clock? So let them stay a little later until quarter 3 because they can't get the personnel. That's how I kind of look at the big picture here. Is they're getting paid for the 8, so once in a while, what's wrong with them working for the 8? and leave the people there on the street department because in the summertime, that's where they're greatly needed mm -hmm. so that you can get now your infrastructure. 
uh, repair so that now everybody's going to be happy. All right, well, why don't we suspend on streets for a moment, and we can come back to it if people have more questions. But why doesn't Deb come on up? We could do a little bit on the riverfront. Yes? I just wanted to know, is there any possibility of putting a schedule in the newspaper as to when one, I know mean, weather has a lot to do with it, but, you know, weather permitting. When one street would be beginning and, and where they okay. are in the process, just stay here, stay here. kind of like the, um, the Board of Health does, it shows, you know, how, what restaurants have what rating. Well, we, I think we do have, we, we do put post it out that every in, week. A, in a Facebook form. On the city website. And there's, a, and there's an email. Oh. NashuaNH.gov, the front page, and there's a blue button. No, because we, I think we'd have to buy that, that space every week. Yeah, we don't want to spend it. You know, I mean, I love the telegraph, but uh, that's more money out the door. So it's on the blue button on the NashuaNH.gov website. You just scroll down on that front page, and it says uh, Road Constructions, Detour, and Paving. Click on it, and every week I post it. I also post everything I know about. So if we're working on the sewers, if Liberty is working on something, if Penichuk is working on something, if someone's taking a big tree down and they're going to close a lane, I try to post everything there so you know what's going on and can avoid it if possible. It's also on our Facebook page, Nashua Public Works, if anybody is on Facebook. And it's, if you use Twitter, it's at Nashua DPW. So I post I don't post the streets every week on deep, the Twitter because it's just too long. But um, I do it on the other two religiously. And I post every day. As soon as I get information from our engineers, it's on that website and it's on that Facebook page to try and keep you all as informed as possible. I read the newspaper, but I'm not Good, sure. good. That's <laughs> well, we'll see if there's something we can't do, but I, I can't promise that. But we'll look into it for you, absolutely. All right, so why don't we go to the river for a little while? All right, one more question. We can come back to the roads. We can, yes. Well, I just, I just wanted to find out, is Alls going to get repaved at something? Because that street is horrible. It is. Yes, it's on the list. They're still doing um, utility work underneath the surface, and we're not going to pave until they're done. So every time we think they're done, well, again, Kinsley Street, right? Because they were supposed to be done in time last year for us to pave last year. And that did not, and they're still out there working on Kinsley some Street. Of some, some, of, some of the hatching that they've done. Not, not top quality? Oh, no. okay. Below or above? Yeah, not top quality. So we, when we see that, or you call me, and usually you'll get me, you'll know, because you'll hear this and you'll, see, you'll hear it again. Uh, we, we immediately go after them to, to prepare those patches. A lot of times it's because maybe the next day or a couple days later they're coming back to finish their work. Usually they're, it's a multiple day project with some of these um, gas leaks and water leaks. And, and just on a side yeah. part there too, like I know Renee was just paved a couple of years ago. Yeah. The cracks that were there originally are pretty much all back. Okay, that I don't know about. I'll have to look into that. And we'll look for crack sealing at least to get that stopped where they are and prevent any further because deterioration. The exact same places they were originally, right. they're back. All right, so we'll take a look at that and get that on the crack sealing list. Thanks. Um, that I just want to mention about paving mayor, and then I promise we'll go to waterways because this okay. is important. It was an important question that you asked. Is the utilities have really presented some serious challenges for us in the paving program? Of course, now we're saying uh, we're going to pave 30 miles of streets, and the utilities are like, "Whoa, wait a minute, guys! Uh, you know we can't keep up with you." So that's that. The utility coordination has been a huge challenge. It's what that's exactly what happened on Kinsley Street. Uh, Liberty just had to keep going back and and had to um, continue. Uh, um, replacing lines and then once they do that you'll notice that they have very small trenches and then they have to go back and then they have to restore those trenches so you probably saw them go back and say what are they doing they're going back in the street so that so that's what they're doing so all we can't get in there until all the utilities are done so we're trying to coordinate with not only liberty but with Penichuk and, and our own sewer work so so that's been probably the greatest challenge we've had with the paving program is trying to just get all that work done ahead of the paving, so that's and that's another reason. Sometimes it will you're, you'll see a street deferred. Um, we may not get to it as quickly as we had hoped because the utilities can't get to the work, and we, we certainly don't want to pave a new street and then have the utilities come in a year or two later and and you know um, and tear it up. So we, we so that's another important. When we were paved that we couldn't uh, 
if they, we anybody if we had to go utilities in there within like three or five years afterwards, right? We were going to have to pay for it. Yeah, exactly. So, just to all right. So. Deb Chisholm works uh, for the city in the planning area and has been very active in the riverfront. Now, we have National River running through the city and through downtown, a great, beautiful natural asset that we want to <laughs> highlight for our residents so people can enjoy the riverfront and, again, a, you know, a magnet for people who want to come to Nashville either as just to see what we have to offer or maybe live here. So. We really have wanted to concentrate on making sure we take full advantage of the Nashua River. <laughs> so we have a riverfront master plan, which Deb is going to tell you about. A little commercial break. A little commercial break here from the um, paving discussion. Um, I'm Deb Chisholm. I work in community <laughs> development. I'm the waterways manager. Um, now, this is my third ward meeting given this presentation, and every time it's been different. So um, bear with me for, for a little bit. Um, Three minutes, right? Three minutes. Um, the uh, the riverfront uh, development plan is something that was started uh, back in 2016. Uh, it's really been the mayor who had asked uh, community development and economic development and DPW to push forward a plan on how to essentially redevelop our downtown waterfront. Um, we have a lot of waterfront down there that is almost essentially invisible to people. Um, unless you're driving across the Main Street Bridge, there's really no place else uh, to be able to view the river from. Uh, so those departments embarked on a very ambitious schedule uh, for community involvement. And that was really the basis behind our whole downtown riverfront development plan is based on community input. Uh, otherwise, we would not really have an understanding of, of where to focus our, our, our resources. Um, so what we're talking about now is um, a downtown development, uh, waterfront development plan that essentially, let me see if I can get this here, goes from Mine Falls Park here in the west and extends all the way down, sorry, <laughs> am I in and out now? Sorry. Um, and extends down to Amory and Bridge Streets. Um, the area that we're focusing on right now is the area that is encompassing, thank you, Vanna. <laughs> the area that we're focusing on right now is this area here. It's the area from the Broad Street Parkway down to the Main Street Bridge. And the work that's going on now really couldn't have been done if we hadn't had the mayor and the Board of Aldermen agree to extend the tax increment financing district um, into this area. So really what we're looking at now, we're looking to connect this area here with the rest of the Riverwalk that has been in existence for a few decades. Um, connect that area to Mine Falls Park. There's a really great trail that runs right through here that we're trying to connect to. Um, and we've also just recently opened a new pedestrian bridge right here near uh, Gate City Fence uh, near on Ledge Street um, that allows more access into Mine Falls Park. Um, so the connection is really important. The visibility of the river walk and the, and the river is very important as well. So we're working right now on uh, an aquatic and a land side invasive species program to hopefully get rid of the invasive species that are dominating the banks of the river that are really preventing people from, uh, from actually enjoying it. Um, another thing that we're working on um, is getting together uh, an engineering and design company to come out and actually give us the details on how to implement this plan that we had created. So I apologize, we had a really great video that would show you the redevelopment plan. You can go online to the city's website and up in the search bar you can put in uh, riverfront development plan. It's a fairly large file. It might take a little while for it to download onto your computer, but it's got some really great pictures and it's got um, an explanation of really what we're looking at is some cantilevered walkways, um, a dock area that would allow folks to come downtown on their boats, leave their boats, and actually be able to go downtown and have lunch. Um, and 
again, invasive species that we're looking to get rid of. We're trying, in, we're in the process of developing a lighting program uh, to provide better visibility, a little bit more safety in that area downtown. And we're also looking, again, to install some uh, fountains. I know a lot of people have said to me, where's the fountain? What happened to the fountain? The fountain broke. We couldn't fix it. You can put that down. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but now we are in the process of getting together the funds to purchase additional fountains um, to be installed in August at the latest. Um, so that's really what we're looking at right now. That's kind of your um, commercial in between the really hard subjects. Um, a nice fun program that's going on that probably over the next year or so um, you'll really start seeing some changes downtown. So everything is easier said than done. Like the, these fountains, before they could be implemented, for we needed to actually change the electric service along the river because we needed to bring the electric to the, to the river so the fountains could operate. Now, how the other fountain operated without it, it was kind of a rig system that didn't work very well. So that had to go out to bid a couple of different times, and then it had to be constructed. And you know things tend to go on and on and on. So, but when we were very excited about the riverfront plan, and I think uh, when we finish the lighting, when we remove the invasive species, when we uh, cantilevered walkways is like around peddlers. You can you, know, you walk around peddler's daughter uh, suspended above the, 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 the river uh, w without uh, poles going down, sort of built, supported by the building. Uh, that's, that's a cantilevered walkway. So those would be on all three all the other three corners of the Main Street Bridge uh, and other improvements that uh, over time we think can make a big, big difference as far as taking advantage of the river. So, yes, Paula. Yes, good evening. I've got a question about this, the tax increment district. The last time I think I remember the city used it when I, at least when yeah. I was really involved, was when I was an alderman at large and they did it for the building, the condo building behind Dunkin' Donuts. Correct. Now, I don't. Know, I thought that's more for like housing and things like that. Buildings. I didn't, uh, can you use it for walkways when the city's paying for it? How do you do a tax increment district when the city's paying? That's number one. How much is the? Where are you getting the funds for the fountain? And what is the projected cost on this whole project? So um, first on the tax increment financing district. So what that is is uh, it's a, it's it's enabled by state law. In New Hampshire, cities and towns can really only do what the state says they can do. You can't, uh, so it's not a so-called home rule state. So we can only do what we're authorized, specifically authorized to do. But in any event, uh, state law allows a tax increment financing district. And what it says is that once you outline an area, additional improvements, increases in uh, when, it, when a building is redeveloped, the extra taxes that are captured as a result of that uh, increase uh, can be used to make improvements within that district. So what Paula was talking about is when the, when the uh, condos, uh, uh, the Jackson, Jackson Falls condos were built, there was a small tax increment financing district right around here, and it is used to pay for <coughs> So that the extra money generated by those condos was used to pay for the cantilevered walkway and the, uh, and the other improvements that go down to margaritas. So what the Board of Aldermen passed was an expansion of that, of that tax increment financing district to include um, Lofts 34, the uh, Clock Tower Place, and some of these, this kind of area around the river. So as the development in that area occurs, the additional tax dollars that are realized from that defined area uh, can be directed to pay for the riverfront improvements. So the idea is uh, kind of success builds on success. So as uh, something like Lofts 34 gets redeveloped, then that money is reinvested along the river, which, may, which, which will stimulate other investment along the river. Uh, they're talking about projects uh, at the Picker Building and elsewhere. And in the end, 
uh, the city has a much nicer riverfront paid for by the development that's occurring along, uh, right around the river. So that is a tax increment financing district. Um, it, you know, the, the, the cost of this, uh, of the, the section we're working on now is, depends exactly what we do. We don't have actual costs in the sense that uh, we need the engineering of the cantilevered walkways. The cost of doing the lighting plan is, uh, we're putting that out to bid. We think it'll be several hundred thousand dollars. Uh, the cost of the cantilevered walkways is not cheap. Those, uh, those are, you know, those are pretty complicated. Uh, the um, eradication of the invasive species is costing uh, 100000 from the city. The state's putting some money in. These are kind of rough dollars. The estimate for this whole, this, whole th this whole area, this phase, when the master plan was done, I think was in the $4 million range, uh, including the cantilever walkways, all the lighting, expanded uh, river walks, and a small pedestrian bridge. But we will really undertake these things as the tax increment financing district um, generates the money to do so. I think I got all those questions. But thank you for starting the tax increment financing approach. I that was... vote on that, so don't thank me. <laughs> what? You can thank uh, Mrs. McCarthy because. Oh, thank you. Brian, uh... <laughs> Brian did that. <laughs> <laughs> Any okay. other questions, comments? Now you're taking general yeah. questions? Yes, how about in the back? I have a question you brought up earlier about the, using the landfill as expansion for the Department of Public Works. Correct. Well, I'm going to butter to that. And right now, the way it is, I'm living in, my neighbors are living in 24 everyday noise. Not a little noise, a lot of noise. Now, what street do you live on? Farmwood. Farmwood? Correct. Yeah. It is loud. We have to have earplugs. I reported it to the EPA and I'm going to report it to the state. There's rules about noise. And there is. You're Mr. Smith? Are you Harrison? I'm Mr. Ferry, correct. Ma 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 Ms. Harrison, right? So well, you make all these I think Lauren has talked with you a few times and we're trying to address, you know, I think they're trying to address your concerns <laughs> and uh, uh, we want everyone living around the landfill to be comfortable. The noise is prohibitive. It's miserable. It's not a little noise. It's a lot of noise, and you can't manage. You can't manage that, and then you want to expand the bit, the landfill more to put more stuff in it. And what is? What do you think the noise is coming from? I it's mean, it's coming from the landfill. The people, what just burying the trash and the like? No. It's starting at eight o'clock at night. I have had to be under doctor's care because I have been suffering from sleep deprivation. I don't think anybody needs to go to bed with earplugs, with earmuffs, with a scarf wrapped around their ears, it's with machines of white noise. Who's laughing about it? There. Kids can't sleep. White there. noise. If you're in the middle of the night. You have kids. Nobody's they can't there. study because they're woke up. It's they the hang from the trucks. They the so, gate slammed down. So, I had a neighbor who works for the IRS and comes up that road at 1.30 in the morning and she had to call the police because she thought there was a vile explosion. The clanging of the trucks. I can't see why they don't reserve a certain amount of time, a certain day or a certain night where they do the dumping of this. We went on a tour. That's a very, very large place or they could put up some barriers. I feel as though they're living with me. So, and the noise is atrocious. You want so, them to come down there at night when they're doing the work. Can I, hear it for yourself. Can I just, can I just uh, speak to this for a second? First of all, I apologize for uh, any noise that you've been kept awake at night and all of that. Um, I will tell you that it's not from the landfill, it's actually from the paving program. It's millings that are coming in from the paving program. We've had to do some milling at night on Amherst Street and Broad Street and, uh, and others. So that, that's what that's from. Um, but we like, have, for, we excuse have, me, I don't mean to overspeak you, but do we need to put up with this from 8 o'clock at night 
and it continues mm -hmm. on because it's like a loop. It just goes through so, a reel so constantly. I understood, and, 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 and I apologize for that, and, and I know that that's I a horrible thing to live with. But, but, but what we're going to, can I just finish, Mr. Ferry? Just no, let me, because, let, because, because let me just. What you're doing is what's going on. First of all, you have the normal operation of the landfill, which, which by the state is restricted to certain hours because of noise. Then what you did, then you sort of wavered it to put the landfill expansion in. So that's making noise. Then you sort of say, well, isn't really the landfill making the noise. It's the people that are doing the road for staging area. It's still coming from the landfill. And who's responsible for these people coming through? Don't they get their direction from somebody? Yes. So Do, are they not told about the people who abut this landfill? What we are being uh, crucified by? And also the odor. I wake up every morning with a sore throat. I'm waiting to grow another thumb. I cannot plant a garden because of what leeches from there. I get all kind of garbage. Do I need to be a trash woman and go out in the yard and pick up trash? That's not the problem. The problem is my health, which is being compromised because of them. And, and actually, I even thought at one time that they were having people come from other areas. Now, I was told there's three landfills in New Hampshire, and it seems like they're using the national one for, to the best of their, uh, you know, revenue collecting. Well, n no. Actually, uh, Nash was by far the smallest of the landfills in New I Hampshire. The, the, other two are, the, well, other yes. two, the other two are very large. One is owned by Casella. Um, it's in Bethlehem, New Hampshire, a very large commercial uh, landfill. The other one is the biggest, one of the big, probably the biggest uh, in the Northeast, which is Turnkey Landfill, owned by Waste Management in Rochester. Um, our, the, four hills, the Four I, Hills, ma'am, can I, just let, let me just finish. I, 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 know, I know you're frustrated, but, but it might, I might be able to help. Health. I under, I've understand been healthy that. all these years until you know I'm living with so, these neighbors. So we're we're very we have we only take Nashua trash at the Four Hills landfill. That's it. We don't take trash from any other communities. We're very 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 heavily regulated. We have we have permits. Happy to have you come in and and sort through those. And you can see um, there are no concerns for your health. I I, I promise that that um, we the state is very 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 conscious of 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 everything and, and we have we have air permits we have solid waste permits we have epa permits we have we have a we have a lot of permits we're very heavily regulated and we do really run a, a good operation the the frustration that you're hearing from the millings that were coming in we've changed our operations we have a, set, a 500 foot setback on the side of jensen's i'm assuming that's where where you you live um or, or near there um, there's a 500 foot setback yeah, that was required when we when we put in the phase feet. two landfill. So what we do what we were doing is putting the millings in that setback. Okay, so that setback is part of the landfill, but no waste can go in there. there. It's a 500 foot area, so we need a lot of material. So what they were doing is they were coming in at night, and they were they were dumping right in that setback. When, as soon as we found out that it was a nuisance to residents. We ceased doing that. They're now dumping on a completely different side of the landfill, so you should not be bothered by that any further. But how further. long, though, to appease us for a certain period of time no. so we'll be no. quiet? No, we won't be, we won't be dumping into the uh, setback after 10 p.m. at night any well, further, so any longer. that all the planning that went into the grindings that caused all the noise didn't seem to work out so well. So I was supposed to assume you want to expand the DPW into the landfill and probably take the same precautions but not the foresight to understand that's going to cost a lot of that's going to be a lot of noise well so our, the normal operate our city operations for public works is from 6 45 a.m to 2 45 p.m when you're for the most out it, what when you're building out the expansion of the dpw in the landfill then they might be well there, that, how when they, they would there would probably be some noise from and construction then, and what about the noise after that what about the normal operations the dpw the, 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 that's going to be 24 hours we what, get what no you reprieve no it's 6 40 our, our hours so our employees work 6 45 yeah, to 2 40. about operations of the dpw going into the landfill that's going to be 24 hours operations Not going the into offices. the landfill no, you said it was offices and operations of the DPW going into the landfill. It's the street department now garage was, eventually? No, that was, a, that, was a, that was my understanding so, of the presentation. Oh, so, so uh, I, first of all, 
let's, I, I really do not want to have a conversation about a DPW facility at the landfill right now because we have, we have no idea if that's going to, well, if I mean, that's even a possibility. We, we, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a thought. Um, the Board of Public Works would have to vote on that. There's a, needs a, a lot of discussion needs to be had. We're not even sure that the soil is suitable um, to build there. We're not sure if renovation might make more sense. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of discussion that needs to be had. We're really not ready to have that. The only the only thing I can tell you now is that our facilities are in deplorable condition. I have I have pictures. You can see them. It, it is horrible what we are asking our staff to work in so we so so we need to do something that's all i know at this point mr huh? barry we don't know where what we're going to be doing at this point well we're on another point about the landfill you made us seem everything was safe well i've been tracking the epa and every five years they do a review of the gilson site every five years the epa does a review of the landfill site they did one in 2014 the gilson site is not the landfill site sir oh, but we're going we're to talk about that. that's a hazardous that's a ha that that had hazardous waste on it and if you okay. look at that report there was indication that there was leach coming out of that landfill and going into the river if you read it carefully and i'll show you the documentation so then i then i talked to the epa about because they're going to do one this year the 2019 review and i talked to them because i read that report and then there was an article in the Telegraph, and you all read it, I'm sure. If you read that specifically, they haven't determined whether that contaminant is contained within the Gilson site. They have to do further analysis. And furthermore, they believe that some of the contaminants is coming from leaching from the landfill. There's absolutely, sir, that, there's no proof of that. It is. There is no proof of that. It, I talked to well, the Gilson site is a, was a hazardous, I mean, it was a Superfund site. But they also, and there were, there's also evidence that this is leaching from the landfill. Uh, uh, what's your name? I'll show you the report. Well, could I, I'm you, happy, to, I'm you happy to review it, sure. sir. So I think what we're hearing is that the, the grinding and milling that was the materials that were generated by the grinding at night. And the reason they're working at night is because in the daytime, if you pave or mill Broad Street or uh, Amherst Street or some of these other major streets, the traffic congestion is horrendous. So they do the work at night and they were bringing it in and, and leaving it in the so-called setback. So now that's been changed in response to, I think, your, your, the points you've made. And uh, why don't we see how that works out? Uh, as far as the operation of the landfill, uh, if 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 the public works operations were expanded there, the normal operations, as Lisa said, were, you know, basically quarter to seven to about two o'clock in the afternoon. That's, that's a permit from the state. No. Well, this this is the, the you know this is the garbage trucks and all that stuff. Now the the. Uh, the only time that that's varied is when there's a snowstorm. I mean, mm -hmm. beyond that, there's no one working well, after. I, I guess what it is, we have some disagreements because you're saying, my understanding from the state, that's a state regulation of when, you, when the hours you can operate because of the sound. The second one is it's not resolved, and I haven't proved it to you, is the EPA has as yet to determine whether there is leaching from the landfill. And I can document All right, well, we, we will look at that. But could, would you mind if we took a couple other questions? Sure. Yes. I want you Sir. to know that it's the, the treble isn't the trouble, it's the base. I have here the signatures of people from Gilson Road, Lunar Lane, Mercury Lane, Musket Drive, Pioneer Drive, Pluto Lane, and Saturn Lane from the expanded landfill. It starts at 6.45 in the, in the morning and goes to 4 in the afternoon. It shakes so much that some of those mobile home units shake the pictures off the wall. They're 50 yards to 75 yards behind Peter's three. And I'll, I'll be happy to. All right, thank you. So I think what's happening now, and Lisa can um, correct it, is that, of course, the landfill is being, phase three is being constructed. So this isn't normal operations. Now, I don't know, where are we in the construction of phase three? We're just beginning. But we're doing the site work. Right so now. the. You know, the, 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 the Nashville landfill was established in the 70s, early 70s. Um, we are the only f city in the state, I don't know, with an actual yes. operating landfill. This saves the taxpayers millions and millions of dollars because we don't have to pay to ship trash to Rochester. 
and we're trying to, over time, to eliminate the inconvenience for people who live nearby. Um, but I think when the landfill was established in the 70s, you know, the people who did it uh, had a lot of foresight because they could see that um, uh, it would benefit the residents as a whole for a long time. And if this phase three goes forward and the next phase, the uh, next phase would fill in the gaps but, you know, in between the, the, the hills that are there now, this could go for another 40, 50 years. But I think what you're, I think, just what I'm hearing is that the noise you're hearing now is the construction of phase three. And uh, that will end sometime, you know, I don't, how long is that construction going to take? It should be done by the end of September, October time frame. They can't cut down any more trees because no. they've already cut down no, all the trees. No, the, the tree clearing has been That's good. done. That's done. I'm, but, and, I, and I'm not aware of, of any nuisance in those neighborhoods. This is the first well, time I'm you, hearing Well, you can go it, and so. see all these people and, and check with people sure. whose pictures can't even stay on the wall from the, from the uh, idling of the equipment. Well, look, we'll try to work on these things. I mean, over time, I mean, there, I'm sure we've heard a little bit about odor now, but there used to be a lot more odor issues. And uh, Public Works, over time, has done a lot to contain the owner. We, odor. We have... Uh, we have methane recovery systems, a, a, um, a methane recovery system that's expanded every year to prevent the emission of methane gas. Uh, it is captured and then burned. Um, one big reason for that, now this goes back, a, you know, this has been done over a long period of time. One big reason for that is because it helps with the odor. and. There may be odor issues now, but they're certainly less than they used to be. And I think that public works will work to try to solve these noise issues now that, you know, these are coming now forward. Aware, absolutely. Ma'am. It's not just the odor. Um, on occasion when the site is vented, um, I'm not sure what chemicals come out of there, but they're toxic. They, they burn your nostrils. And I don't, I don't understand why that would happen. It does smell bad, but it's not just the smell. It is well, it's the, it's the, um, I mean, I, of course, there's scientific analysis of all this, but it's basically methane gas coming. coming. It, it used to be especially during the winter, but now it's coming And what, now. what, what so, street do you live on? Mercury Lane. Mercury Lane. So I'm, I'm the person who collected those voluntary signatures. It, you get it. It's highlighted in yellow. Yes, Harold. If you experience odors, please call us immediately um, and let us know that, okay. um, so that so that we can look into. Um, you know, a, a landfill is a dynamic environment, so it's ever changing. Um, we had we had a landfill company who was managing our gas called um, Fortistar, and they were managing our well field and the gas plant. That was wasn't working out very well. Um, because they weren't pulling hard enough on the wells, and, and therefore there were, there were quite a few odors. Probably <clears throat> those of you who have lived in this neighborhood a long time remember it probably oh, yes, 10 years ago. It, yes, was, it, was, it was horrible. Yep. Um, we changed that. I fought very hard to yep. get them out of the landfill. <laughs> we now are working we with had, a great We company. had a big litigation we, with them. We and... also have... Um, <laughs> our own well tuner on staff, so we have the ability to pull really hard on those wells to, so that we can reduce odors as much as okay. possible. Um, but it's ever changing, so we like to hear from residents. If, if you're, if you're, if you, you know, no, I, I if you have I'll odors, call. you know, call the landfill. I'll, I'll be polite. We, because, because we have somebody on staff that can get right out there, and okay. and by tuning wells, we can we can help fix that. When it, you probably notice when it when it there's, there are heavy rains, you'll probably get odor. Rain is not a landfill's friend. Yeah. Um, because it, it really decomposes the trash and, you know, um, creates odors. So, you know, let us know that because we, we really do want to know. And we and, and, and there we really are things that we that, <laughs> there yeah we have we have had a lot of rain and it's a nightmare for landfill and, and we'll we'll work to to uh, help. So, and if you some call immediately, <clears throat> it helps them to <coughs> discover the source. Like yeah. if someone calls and says three days ago it really smelled, it, it, it very difficult to figure out. Well, what could that have been three days ago? So I, if, I it's, me if it so smells if it's, right now, uh, that's the most there, helpful. There's two ways to contact us. There's um, five eight nine three four one zero is the is the um, 
the landfill, the direct line. Uh, Ro where's Ms. Roslyn? Ms. She, you'll talk to Ms. Roslyn. She'll be answering the phone, and she does a great job over there. Uh, Roslyn's probably going, oh, please don't have them. Um, or there's also DPW solid waste at NashuaNH.gov um, is another way that you can you can reach us if, if you prefer not to call. Is that, now, is that phone number they call any time, 24 hours? That, no, that is not a 24-hour line. Um, we don't have a 24-hour line. So, so, so when you experience this, the mayor says call when we experience it. Call, call when, when you experience, experience it. when we experience it at 11.15 at night or 2.30 in the morning, shall, shall we call you, Mary? No. You could. If, you, if it's late you at could. night, use the DPW solid waste at nashwinh.gov. Okay. So, Ernie, um, do you have anything to add? I, we should have called on you a little earlier. You know, you're the Ward 5. Anything to add about what's going on we, or your thoughts on anything? I, I think my constituents have brought <laughs> up the, uh, the important things that, that we wanted to brought out tonight. Okay. Well, well, the smell, I hate to object because the smell's not just the methane. Sometimes it, it, the, state, every, the state under your permit, at the end of every day, you're supposed to cover the landfill with <laughs> Yes. At times you weren't doing that, and I called Jeff, who manages it, and he says, oh, we do it. He says, well, I don't think you do. <coughs> so I had to go there with a camera and take pictures and send them the pictures to show that the landfill, what the, the dirt wasn't there. And then he did it, and then he missed it again. The landfill did it again. And when they don't cover it, it's going to stink like garbage. Dirty diapers. Dirty Sweet. diapers. <laughs> All right. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware that the landfill was cover ever it. not covered. I have to take pictures. Okay. I'll send you the pictures. All right. Please do. Now, is there anyone who hasn't asked a question yet who would like to raise something? Yes, yes, sir, in the back. Okay. This is kind of a little different question. How's our recycling program going? I know the costs are up. And costs are up. So the um, when we started the recycling program, which was 87, 88, I was actually mayor at that time. And we started with a pilot. And we knew where, and it, it expanded to curbside the city wide. We knew where the, where the materials were going. We were shipping paper to a mill in Maine to be made into pulp. We were providing aluminum to Coca-Cola and they were using the aluminum to uh, uh, remake, use it to, to, re, re, to make a new, new cans. And um, but, and Lisa's been very involved in this for a long time, over time, well, we, we went to single stream recycling, meaning everything gets combined it, at the, at, in the, in the, in the uh, tote or in your, in your basket. And then it is mechanically separated by the contractor who takes this recycling away. Um, and that was going okay, you know, fine for till till recently, up till a year and a half ago or so. I think the the cost for the city of disposing of recyclables, meaning what would it, what was it costing us to have someone pick up the combined stream, take it away, separate it, and then um, distribute the uh, different constituent materials, was eighty some cents a ton. Most of the recycling was going to China. Then China said, we don't want recycling anymore. And this was a year and a half ago, or you know, something in that vicinity. And in a, in a very uh, rapid series of ratcheting up, the cost of disposal went from 80 cents a ton to $80 a ton. So that's a 100-fold increase in, you know, three to six months. So all of a sudden, the city had to start budgeting quite a bit of money to dispose of the recycling. Uh, last year was budget, last, uh, well, we're still in this current fiscal year. We're almost through. We're through on June 30. This, this current fiscal year, 400,000 was budgeted, and then an additional 100,000 had to be added to that. So the cost was about $500,000. Next year, we're hoping that we can hold it to 400,000. So 400,000 is, is budgeted in the fiscal 20 budget that's going to start on July 1. 
We think the markets are very unsettled. We are hoping that things improve. Uh, we believe, we're being told that the that recycled materials are being shipped to uh, Southeast Asia, not China, but Southeast Asia. Uh, the contractor Casella is saying that they are landfilling the glass. They're separating, but the glass itself, they're just landfilling it. And we're trying to reach a deal with them to kind of use the glass back here in Nashua. Um, so that's the picture. Unsettled, you've seen across the country, you know, articles about communities that are making different decisions. Some on the West Coast, uh, you know, Oregon, Washington, elsewhere. Some com communities have completely suspended recycling. Others are doing like we're doing, trying to maintain. And uh, so I think everybody's uh, kind of up in the air about what, where this is all going in the, uh, in the long term. May I ask a question? I know you're avoiding No, I'm not, Paul, but yeah, I if I, no, wait, let me, I would like to let everybody who. I just asked on an increment just to explain that to people. That's all I asked you to do, basically. Um, I would like to include as many people as possible, so it would be nice to let some people ask their first question. I don't see anybody else's hands up, well, I, except Paul's. Mine was. So. <laughs> Can I ask a question? But you already gave your opinion. No, I didn't. You, yeah. How about Gloria? We'll get back to you, I promise. How about that? I was Gloria. I wondering if, it's, if it was more cost effective when we separated the recycles from the way you're doing it now, sending them all in at once. Now, Gloria's asked the question, was it more cost effective when we were separating at the curb? Um, well, it was much more expensive to do it that way because you had to have a person working for public works at the curb go through every basket and separate all the materials. Um, there was some, some self-separation at the curb, but we were still collecting mostly um, uh, we were kind of asking people to separate a little bit, but a, there was still a lot of manual separation. And it would be very hard to go, because now all the equipment we have picks up the tote. And uh, so it would, you'd have to get rid of all the trucks and you know, start all over again. So uh, I don't know if that's a realistic. Yeah, no, that's a, it, that's a good, that's a fair question. Um, so going to single stream has increased our recycling rates because I think any of you that have a big green toter, right, it's a lot easier to just throw everything in the, in the big green toter. Um, so a lot of communities went to single stream uh, for that reason. Um, and um, there are really great um, what we call MRFs and, and they're recycling facilities that have, it's, they're very cool, they have blowers and magnets and all of, all in screens that separate all of the materials. So they can do it pretty efficiently. Um, that way, and um, so you know that so far the the Board of Aldermen and the Board of Public Works have decided to hang in there and, and see what happens. I think things will turn around eventually. It may take five years or so. It looks like, but but I think um, you know I think I think it, it's a good thing. It saves our airspace, and uh, you know it's the right thing to do. I do have some concerns, as the mayor does, about what's ha what the final disposition of our recycling is. But um, Casella is a good company, and I and I, I you know. I think that they're doing the right thing. So. so how about if we go to Bill, then to Paula? How's that? Oh, we have a... <laughs> Ladies first. No, that's okay. Go ahead. I was just going to ask you a quick question. Why didn't China put the brakes on about a year and a half ago? Any idea? No. I saw it in the paper. I just... I don't know. Um, they, what they did, but we could have this conversation at the office today. Yes, we could. Um, but uh, they, so... Um, what happened was China developed their own markets for recyclables. So they started taking in all of their own recyclables and all their plants. And so uh, they decided then our, the contamination coming from the United States and others um, was, was very high. So they, 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 didn't, they didn't tell us we couldn't ship it, but they, they basically said it has to be less than 2%, which was something we just couldn't eat. Sure. So they, that, they effectively, so now they're just recycling really um, within their own country. Thank so, you. Yeah, and you hear all, all, you saw all sorts of horrible, I'm sure everybody's seen the horrible pictures of all the trash floating in the ocean, and yes. so there's a lot So of, that lot scares of scary, me, that is, you know, what, what's really happening, but anyway, Paula. Okay, I've got several issues here. <coughs> Simone, Simone, me. Simone, I'm trying to figure out what microphone to turn up so I can hear you. Uh, Go ahead. Okay. Go right ahead, Paula. 
um, Alderman Jetty's aware of this, and so is Lisa Photo aware of this. And this, you were aware of this when you came into office four years ago about West Hollow Street. Yes. And I've been on the phone with Chief LaVoy's. Um, it is a nightmare out there, and something's got to be done. Because at Wellesley Road and at um, Ledgewood Hills, people don't know what a red frickin' light is in the city anymore. <laughs> it is the saddest thing, the rudeness of these drivers, because two weeks ago, if I didn't wait for that light, it was green on my side, and then if I didn't sit at that light, I would have been uh, broadsided, my airbags would have deployed, and I probably would have been flipped over. That's how serious it is on West Hollis Street. That configuration, which I complain about since day one, does not work. They drive right down it. It's left turn only. They go right down it because it's just a line in the road. You don't know if they're making a left turn on Gendron. Can we, can we just stop on that just for a second? But it was the other way, as you preferred it. But then there were complaints about the, the other configuration. So some people prefer it as you're advocating. Uh, we could kind of explain the differences, but some people prefer it that way, and that's how it was before, but then it was no, changed it to what we have now. No, it was Based not upon the before. last alderman that was in the office. No. Okay. At, it, we okay. changed it at like a couple of years ago, didn't we? No, what happened yes. was, and I, I don't like sitting, I'm so short, I can't see. What happened was, when you went down at Riverside Drive and you went across, you had to merge to the left. Now we're merging to the right. So the left lane virtually becomes a left turn lane as you get to Gengen Street right. and to Ledgewood Hill. People drive straight down that yellow line, so you don't know where they're going. And sometimes they're making that yeah, turn it's definitely a problem. or to West onto Ledgewood Hill. Or when they get to that traffic light, they realize, uh-oh, and I'm just going to cut over. And you just don't know where you're going on that. And it's, it's very dangerous, and especially when they keep running that red light. So. I, I mean, this has just gone on and on, and you know, things got better, but now it isn't better anymore. So I want to bring that to your attention. Alderman Jetty said he was going to hopefully set up a meeting with us complainers, I guess. Now, can, so I, they, can I just, if there's a better way to configure the, the striping, we're not against it. We're, it's just, it was another way, we switched it, there were complaints the old way, now there are complaints the new way. Um, you know, it's just, uh, to some degree, a matter of, deciding you know, which we, problem you and, want to have. And, 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 and you're right, uh, Mrs. Johnson. There, there's just some terrible driving that's going on. It yes. really contributes the to the problem. The now, I did, I did act because, I, because you had said you were going to come and ask about this, I did ask the police for kind of what. I know, and I spoke to them. And also, now, wait, can I, at least yes. give you, can I at least give you what they're saying? Now, I was hoping the chief could come tonight, but he could not. Um, and we can send you this thing, but they say that between January and June, they made 63 stops. Now, maybe that's not enough, but uh, they uh, gave a lot of warnings. They gave uh, 44 written warnings, about 13 uh, verbal warnings. It says they gave three summonses and they made two arrests. So they are giving a lot of warnings. They're not giving a lot of tickets. But maybe we can get them to try to step this up. But they have done something. We did ask them to you know, go out and kind of t watch I, West Hollister. And I also asked uh, your person in constituent services, and then I spoke to Kim Kleiner, and I asked, has there been a traffic study lately? And when was the last traffic study? I've got nothing. So you know, I understand traffic studies. So I wanted to touch on that, and I just wanted to touch on a few more things quickly. If we have to, and I'm, it's really sad, Alderman Dowd, thank you for coming. Oh, here's uh, Rick Dowd. I wanted to, he wasn't here at the beginning for more, too. Thank you, Rick. I, I think it's sad that there's not one at large alderman here who represents the whole city. Not one. And they really should be here because we're still their constituents, because they represent the whole city. Rick. So we, it's, we just got out of a public hearing and budget meeting, so they were all there. And hey, you know what? I used to be an alderman at large, and I made every freaking meeting I could make because it's important to be there. It is important to hear what your constituents are saying. It, it will, even if you have one that represents, one, they knew. It was it was very out. difficult to schedule all these meetings, and so we had to allow conflict. So they got city hall meetings going on now. I thought maybe everybody was on maternity leave or something. The pack, the uh, the um. 
the PAC, we're talking over $15 million when we need three schools renovated, one possibly a new school. Where's our priority in the city for performing arts center versus schools? If you need schools right now, then something's got to go. You're going to drive us crazy out of here with the taxes. You're talking another 3% possibly this year. People are on fixed incomes, and not everybody has a pension. And what are we going to do? Our raises of Social Security does not meet the cost of living to maintain our homes. So I think we need to make a list of priorities. To me, the Performing Arts Center is not a priority if we have to have schools, but yet our schools are failing, and we're going to build more schools, and we've got to have a Performing Arts Center. So where is the priority in this city? We've got three failing, three schools. All right, so you've raised a lot of things, and... Can we respond to some of these things? Yeah, well, let or me get or, one more thing. One more this. thing, okay. Okay. And the other thing I'm just going to go back because Commissioner, we have a commissioner here, Ackerman, that lives in my neighborhood, and we're talking recycling, and we're talking possibly, possibly down the road moving the barn over. Those two people who were here. Now, the noise will be at night when you do snow plowing. We were told it was never going to go down there. Conway Ice wants another sheet of ice. We charge them a buck a year, I think it is, for 99 years. So if you're going to sell our barn and you're going to move it, we the people should have market value on that land and building rather than just giving it away. We gave it away with Conway Ice. We give everything away in the city, and who picks up the tab? It is us, the taxpayers. And it's about time. We stop giving away. All right, so can we answer some here. of these things? I yes, mean, the you may. The Thank you so much for allowing All right. the time. So um, in terms of property taxes, now we have a couple of people here from the legislature. New Hampshire is a very property tax reliant state. I think the most in the United States. If you combine st all state tax revenue and city <coughs> municipal cities and towns tax revenue across New Hampshire, two-thirds is generated by the property tax. New, uh, Massachusetts, which is still pretty, which is much more property tax reliant than many other states, is only 40 percent. We're 65. Some states in the south, it's very low. Now, why is that? It's because whenever the state gets, gets into problems, at least the history has been for decades to push additional costs onto cities and towns and reduce revenue that goes to cities and towns. The most recent example is the sta state pension system. All city employees but for public works, it's like a, all but like 100 employees, all teachers, firefighters, police, city hall, library, everything, are in the state pension system. And the way that happened, we do not have, but for this small group of public works employees, we don't have, the city doesn't have a pension system. The way that worked is the state went to all the municipalities and said, if you join the state pension system, and this is about 50 years ago, we will always pay 35% of pension costs for all municipalities. Great. So everybody, so I think every municipality joined. That went on for, you know, that was fine for a long time. Then the, they, the state ran into some problems a few years ago, and they went from 35 to 30 to 25 to zero. So the promise was broken. Uh, at the same time, the pension assets were mismanaged for various reasons we could talk about, and they got less, so they were only 60% funded for all liabilities. So the city pension budget went from $8 million, on pay, did we just send a check to the state of New Hampshire, went from $8 million to now it's close to $25 million a year. The violation of that promise has already cost you, the taxpayers of Nashua, almost $50 million in cash, which could build a performing arts center and a new school combined, just the cash that has, we've paid as a result of the violation of that promise. 
Now, in the legis the reason I mentioned the, the, the session now is that in the legislature this year, the budget passed by both the House <laughs> and the Senate so far has, has reversed this trend. I mean, certainly we're not getting back all this pension money or <laughs> anything like that, but uh, we would get rather than reduced educational aid every year, we would get uh, some increase and there would be some municipal aid. So under the, under the uh, budget passed by the House and the Senate, I think there would be $13 million coming to the city over two years that we do not get now. Thank you to our legislators who have fought very hard for this budget because uh, it will help with property taxes and it's a good start. Uh, the uh, the budgeting in, in a city, especially with all these pressures from the, from the state and elsewhere, is difficult because every year we have to decide, do we want to spend money on, you know, what level of services we, we can we can afford, what level of property taxes can, can people afford. Of the cities in New Hampshire, Nashua does have the second lowest property taxes. Portsmouth is lower, but, you know, houses there are three times as expensive. Manchester, Concord, they have, uh, they, Claremont, significantly higher taxes than Nashua has. We, we're at about 21-21 uh, on, you know, we're about 2% of value. They're, they tend to be much higher than that. Um, so, you know, every year the Board of Aldermen tries to balance the needs versus the, 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 the what people can afford. Uh, we try to make it possible for seniors to stay in the city because we have the most generous property tax exemption for senior citizens of any community in New Hampshire. But it is a tough balancing act and especially when we get hit with, over a period of a few years, an extra $50 million in cash that we have to pay out to meet what used to be a state obligation. Now, as far as the Performing Arts Center, um, it was done because it was designed and is designed to create economic, and I, you know, I just want you to know, I know that you don't agree with this strategy, but it is an economic development strategy. As I mentioned at the beginning, downtown Nashville is a profit center for the city. It subsidizes $6 million. It subsidizes services across the city. There's no way they use $6 million of services in downtown Nashua. A similar quarter of a mile in a residential neighborhood might generate, a square quarter might generate, you know, 50,000, not 6 million. So the South End, the downtown, and Amherst Street subsidize, help us subsidize uh, taxes and services across the city. If by bringing 70,000 people to Main Street, a year uh, to patronize businesses, to uh, uh, spend money. We can increase property values. We can build a business, stronger business base downtown, and we can uh, boost that six million dollars, as I said at the beginning, from to eight to nine to ten to twelve. It will only help everyone in the city, and it will pay more than pay for the cost of a performing arts center. Now some people, and I will, uh, I will get, okay. Some, there, was a, there was this case that we should do this at Daniel Webster College. Well, there was no way we're doing it at Daniel Webster College. Why? Because it would do nothing for the business climate in the city. People would drive in and drive out to Daniel Webster College, the former Daniel Webster College, and what would we, get, what would we gain from that? I mean, nothing. So the idea was to put it downtown where it would help build a business, a stronger business climate. Nashua is a relatively affluent community by average family income, by uh, average uh, household income. More affluent than Manchester and most other cities in New Hampshire, I think all except for possibly, except for Portsmouth more than Lowell, more than Lawrence, so we're a relatively affluent community, but there are 293 census districts in New Hampshire, and the poorest one out of 293 is downtown Nashua. So 
Definitely, there needs to be economic development and economic growth down there. And the Performing Arts Center is part of an economic development strategy to build a stronger economy in an area of the city that is very weak. So you can disagree or agree with the strategy, but I just want you to know that it's, it's not like, oh, we just want to you know, spend money to give people a good time. I and mean, we want to do that. We want to make this a place where people want to live. We think that it will improve the quality of life. We think young people will, be, will help with them, but there is an economic development strategy behind it, and it is designed to, uh, as I said, build a stronger economy. So, ma'am. Yes, I was ambivalent about the Performing Arts Center until I went to Manchester and saw how lively and how many people were out at night and doing all kinds of things. And then I looked at downtown Nashua, and really it's kind of dead. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Well, we I, don't I, think it's dead, but, but you're right. The, <laughs> the, <laughs> the Palace <laughs> Theater brings 140,000 right. people a year to right. Hanover Street. There's a big, big difference in the feeling from downtown Manchester and downtown Nashua. And so I, you know, like I said, I was ambivalent until I saw that. It's a huge difference. All right, yes. Um, Tracy. Tracy Pappas, and I'm on the Board of Public Works. And I did want to thank the people who bought the landfill. That is, a, that is a big sacrifice. And the whole city benefits by having a landfill. And I, 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 did, want to, I did want to chime in regarding the facility. Because my feeling is when the cameras are running and we're at board meetings, this decision hasn't been made. But when the cameras aren't running, my view is, thank you, my, 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 my feeling is, yes, the decision's been made and it, it will be at the landfill. And as someone who represents the city at large, I think at a certain point right now, we kind of, it's, it's a little bit spread out. Even Ward 5 does do far more than th th they really do take, take the brunt of public works. Um, but, you know, Riverside is not too, too close to a neighborhood. The barn is, is near a place. And Greeley Park is, you know, far enough that I think it really doesn't um, disturb people. Um, and I just, I just think that um, we need to do our homework. I think traffic studies need to be done. And I really fear that extra truck traffic is very unfair to place into, into one neighborhood. So. Well, of course, I, the, I reason we're in this the reason we're in this spot is that, and the, you know, at the time these were, I'm not really saying these weren't good decisions, but there was more than enough room for any public works expansion, relocation, anything you wanted around our current facility. But then Stelos went there because I probably it was cheaper to do it there because there was no land cost. <laughs> then the Y, then Conway. And now there's no space left. So had in those prior years, you know, I, but the other side of it is that uh, a very, um, uh, very interesting, very worthwhile resident, uh, recreational area is being, has been developed there and it happens that Public Works is right in the middle of it. So there's nowhere for Public Works to go at this point. I, I think it was planned, I, I sense that it was planned that way. I think a lot of that, I think a lot of that land was given away and it's that's neither here nor there that's why a um commissioner ackerman has had made the suggestion that back in the 70s when they did the barn that they that they could put another floor on it can we get absolutely everything that we want probably not but i think at a certain point i think the city should 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 be able to share in who you know? Who takes certain departments? And 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 I think that um, I think that the, the 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 folks that live near the landfill have um, had to do more than their fair share of of being tolerant. And that's 
That and, and I'm not for up for election this time, by the way. I All right. Yes, ma'am. As far as the landfill, there's a hundred foot setback. That's what I'm told. Five hundred. Five hundred? Five hundred. I was told I was told hundred by by the park office. Oh, no, it's 500. 500. Okay. At the landfill? Well, they're, they're going right to 500. Let me see. Um, is there going to be any fencing or any kind of barrier so we're not looking at, like, we had, we had just trees and everything. Now we're looking at, there's a big hill that's bare, totally bare of anything. And I, where, I asked, where, I did. Where do you live? The end of Saturn. Saturn? Okay. Uh, let, let me, we will look at that, absolutely. Because I did ask, I did call and I, I asked about it because um, I said the other thing is cutting all these trees. What about the wind damage to whatever's left? Because they're going to take the brunt of it. And we get high winds lately. Mm -hmm. And then the hill, they, they cleared that hill of like every tree. And I said, what about the runoff? Mm -hmm. So that has all been... Uh, and looked said, at very know, closely and was, well engineered. All that's looked into, I guess. Yeah, it has been. It has, and, and again, I don't have the the plans, but um, there there are probably, you know, hundreds of pages of of plans that have been developed by Sanborn Head for the landfill, and all of that has been taken into consideration. Um, but I will look at, at at the buffer to make sure Do that you know, um, there's enough of a buffer. What's going to be dumped in that part of the landfill? It'll be it'll be MSW, municipal solid waste trash. It'll be trash. Yes. And then on Gilson Road, that little brook that keeps overflowing over the hmm. over the street. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've been here only about a year and a half. The people that were here longer around me, my neighbors said it never used to overflow. Okay. And right now, I just looked at it again today. It's almost up to the road, and we have we rain we have had a Is tremendous that? amount of we've had a lot of rain. You probably noticed, um, and we've had, we, we have had. They, they bring a, dose, a little dose we've, of rain, and they do something. We've had we've had drainage issues that we've never seen before all over the city, um, and I wish we could address them all. Unfortunately, we don't have the resources to, um, but we're we're trying to do whatever we can. Um, I know Lauren will tell you she's over there that she just uh, we've, we've just have lists and lists of people that are calling in um, with drainage issues that we've never seen before. Um, so, but we we'll, we'll take we'll, we'll take a look at that, see if there isn't something that we can do. Certainly. Yes. Now um, we we can take one more comment because we promised to get out of here uh, around this time. Uh, Gilson Road, that little brook there that's flooding. We have a major problem with beavers right now, and they are plugging those pipes up constantly, and we are there almost once a week yeah. to unplug those things. It's, it's, it's a real problem. And the same thing on Buck Meadow. We finally squared that away. But, uh, yeah, we, have a, we, we do have a problem over there. Well, Buck Meadow, you got to think because it's not coming out of Wobbles Pond. Somebody vandalized the, uh, the flow that goes into old, old Bridge Road. Okay. Yeah, the level on the pond has probably gone up a good two and a half, maybe three feet. Mm. I'm adding it's starting to take more and more tree and more and more land around that area. Somebody put a rock down there. It's not the beavers anymore that's stopping the water, which you guys used to take care of. But right. now it's a vandal with a rock, and of course the sediment around the rock now is you know, restricting the water coming out of there. So before we conclude, does any, do either of our members of the legislature want to add anything to uh, about what's going on, or no? You want to mm -hmm. say something? Yeah, Mike. Hi, uh, my name is Mike Peterson. Mike, I'm one of the front face. Thanks. Uh, my name is Michael Peterson. I'm one of the three representatives from Ward 5. Allison Nutty Wong is here, and the other state representative is Daniel Toomey. <clears throat> um, I think at this term in the legislature, we gave a lot of thought to the downshifting of cost to cities and towns. That was one of our priorities, and also the uh, improved funding for special for public education. and. Uh, uh, at least I bear that in mind for my votes, and there are, um, you know, many different committees up there. I'm just on one of them, but we vote on like hundreds of bills, and so we just try to keep certain thoughts in mind, and that is the downshifting of cost, 
public schools and the availability of of um, <clears throat> whatever. <laughs> okay, lost my thought. So one other thing I should tell you. Uh, a big issue that has come up recently is the issue of commuter rail from Manchester, Nashua to Boston. So there are three major phases to that. The first phase was a study, and that was done at no cost to taxpayers to use federal money. But the second phase um, just got approved by the Senate and the House, and now it's on the governor's desk, and that is to do the engineering plan to come up with the actual firm costs, what it's going to take to put a commuter rail in, and we hope the governor will sign that. And then the third phase will be actual implementation of putting in a rail. So um, that's been talked about quite a bit among people from Nashua, and that has been a priority of ours. And we have 27 representatives, and they all support commuter rail. So that's really, uh, we appreciate that. Anyway, so thank you, Michael. Now, we do promise to not only get you home, but uh, you know, let people do their work here. So thank you for coming to our Ward 5 Town Hall. And hopefully, uh, you'll come back next year. And if uh, you have any additional questions, just talk to Lisa or, or um, Cheryl here, uh, who's waving her hand, or um, Carrie over there. and. Uh, uh, add anything that uh, you haven't covered so far. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you.